Can I first of all extend our heartfelt concern and prayers to everybody here and those who couldn't be here in the light of the recent terrible floods, terrible, terrible situation. And I extend my thoughts and prayers to you. Uh, this is a very, very difficult subject to discuss flippantly. So I'm afraid that for 30 minutes, I am really going to follow what my instruction was, which is to give a 30-minute speech, a 30-minute lecture on the ethics of persuasion. I mean, essentially, a speech is something which is an opinion. It's something which you can uh, write, you can make up, you can talk about. A lecture is something which implies and should be supported by some pretty detailed research and thought, and I've done that. It's quite difficult to follow. There are lots of issues that it raises. And um, as you may know, I've got to leave at nine to go back to London. So I am happy to take a few questions at the end. The idea of the Grayling Lecture came about because I made a, an acceptance speech at the Stockholm Sabre Awards. And this is what I said. We should never forget that public relations is an immensely powerful tool which has been further intensified in the 21st century by the power of social media. Therefore, we should never use our professional skills to promote anything in which we do not believe and whose causes we cannot espouse. This is a notoriously demanding profession requiring great personal resilience and emotional robustness. If we only promote those clients in whose interests we can genuinely believe, then we can, with a clear conscience, ask three questions each night before falling asleep. Question number one, have I done work today of which I am proud? Have I made money for myself and for my client? And thirdly, and of great importance, have I enjoyed myself? I concluded, if you cannot answer all those three questions with a resounding yes for more than three months, then get out of the PR business. Paul Holmes asked if I would develop these remarks into a short lecture. For a while I prevaricated, then one cold winter's day, a few weeks ago, I read a quotation by one of your US five-star generals, General Omar Bradley. We have, he said, grasped the mystery of the atom and rejected the Sermon on the Mount. The world has achieved brilliance without wisdom, power without conscience. Ours is a world of nuclear giants and ethical infants. And I was so moved by this that I rang Paul and I said, I want to examine the morality of our profession, the ethics of persuasion. And I was immediately worried by, that by doing this, I might give my audience, give you the idea that I had some kind of superiority on this subject. May I immediately disabuse you of that? I am at a stage in my professional career and in my life in which I look back over the years and consider the many mistakes I have made and the sins I've committed. I'm extremely conscious of those failings, and all I'm going to try to do is to help you not make the same mistakes that I did. I was also concerned that I'd bitten off more than I could chew, and so I was glad to find a very good quote by the father of modern anthropology, Claude Levi Strauss. He said, the wise man doesn't give the right answers, he poses the right questions. So that is what I'm going to try and do. I'm going to try and be wise and pose some questions. Where shall we start? Let me first agree with you all a couple of points of definition. Morality Morality is what governs our personal overall behavior. Its objective is to promote what is good in society and minimize what is bad or harmful. 
This behavior may be rooted in religion or purely human humanist. Professional ethics, on the other hand, is the code which a professional person should follow in the workplace in the execution of his profession. However, and this is very, very important, I cannot conceive how an immoral person can scrupulously endorse and follow demanding professional skills, ethics. The professional code is a system for policing behavior. Rules tell us what to do in proscribed circumstances. But our PR profession is not possible to prescribe in this manner. It is infinitely varied and global in application. Nobody, nobody can produce a PR code which covers every possible PR eventuality. It is therefore how we behave instinctively, particularly in a crisis, which will determine how our business is viewed. In those circumstances, it is our innate morality which guides us, the kind of people we have become, and not any code of professional ethics. And our professional reputation is determined by what we actually do, and not what we claim to do, or the ethical codes which allegedly govern our professional behavior. I'm going to gather the analysis under four headings. First, are we honest enough about what we do for a living and how the digital revolution has begun to change that? Number two, how should we be regulated? Number three, do we employ the right kind of people? Four, do our values match those of our clients? First of all, are we honest about what we do for a living? For many, the mere idea of ethics in PR is oxymoronic. I've no difficulty at all in defining what I do for a living and have done for 50 years. I try and put my client's case and encourage others independently and with authority to endorse that case, whether they are politicians, journalists, lawyers, doctors, or any other relevant independent authority. Of course, that's not all I do, but that is absolutely central to it. Some claim that this kind of definition makes us the same as lawyers, and that everyone has the right to PR representation just as everyone has the right to legal representation. Like lawyers, the argument goes, PR professionals are simply advocates in an adversarial climate. But lawyers, and this is the rub to the story, but lawyers represent cases in courts which are structured and designed to guarantee fairness and equality of argument. PR people, on the other hand, operate in a court of public opinion where no counterbalancing argument is guaranteed and governed by an accepted set of rules. But nevertheless, does everyone have a right to PR representation? I mean, would anyone here today accept a PR brief from Assad? But before the storm, there were plenty of PR people willing to act for the Libyan or the Syrian regime. There were plenty of politicians too. And what do we do when we discover that the country's account we were so pleased to win shows itself to be less than we hoped? A country with no regard for human rights a voting system allegedly democratic, but voters filled with fear. And if that feels extreme, what about an internal company communication which reassures the workforce, and yet we know that there are redundancies around the corner? Are we sometimes, this is the question, are we sometimes being used as a front to do things with which our clients do not wish to be associated themselves? Does our commercial drive make us less willing to make our moral position known? Do we sometimes turn a blind eye to our clients' values? And does the digital world make it more difficult? Does the massive positive of social media actually have a negative downside? Have you ever been asked, for example, to wipe out that bad stuff on Google 
Is that good ethical PR? Digital cleansing is not just about removing factually incorrect items or pushing them onto the next page. It's also about removing and hiding items with which the client simply does not agree. For my own part, I've always found it pretty easy to take the big moral decisions, not to kill somebody, uh, things like that. What I have found very much more difficult is what I call moral creep, which is so much more difficult. It's just crossing that line that you do because of the pressure of the day, and it's still morally reprehensible, and you do it because we have to do it. But the next time you do it, it's so much easier. There's a terrific book by Philip Roth in which the hero describes himself at the end of his life as becoming the kind of person with whom he, whom he most despised during his younger days. And the book shows that it was not one immoral act which brought about that decline. It was a series of small incidents which have reduced his moral center. Question two, how should we be regulated? Unless codes of ethics are supported and spirit and letter by every practitioner, they are hot air. And codes of ethics have little influence unless, if found breaking those rules, the practitioner finds it impossible, even illegal, to practice. That is the protection afforded to those who seek help from doctors, lawyers, and other professions. And in reality, regretfully, in PR, this simply is never going to happen. So what real good do these codes do? How many codes do we need, for heaven's sake? There are plenty floating about from many professional bodies. If flouting the professional rules does not hit your pocketbook, then we're thrown back on all this Mother, motherhood and apple pie about honesty, independence, loyalty, fairness, the public interest, wonderfully noble and absolutely useless. And the global marketplace makes these codes even less effective and enforceable. Just think about one phrase that's in one of these codes. There's the phrase, we must always act in the public interest. But what's in the public interest in one part of the world is not in the public interest in another. There cannot be, there cannot be global ethical standards. In some countries, ministers expect personal financial commissions for awarding contracts. And if your clients do it, why shouldn't we? Journalists in some countries attending your press conference will write a favorable piece providing they receive a brown envelope with their so-called travel expenses. If that's the custom, why shouldn't we expect, accept it? And there are plenty of places where propaganda is what PR people peddle, but while its contacts may be doubtful, its practice is the norm. So I struggle with any form of code of ethics for the industry, and the British press would have hounded out of office because the the way that the world is now, is now structured, what applies in one part of the world doesn't apply in another. The British press would have hounded out of office a president who deliberately misled the people regarding his personal intimate life. Indeed, the people, regarding his, the people in England, uh, the media, have just hounded out of office a senior, um, senior secretary of state for who lost his temper and swore in front of the Downing Street gates at a policeman. There are just two areas in which I believe we could have much stricter rules. They are lobbying and financial PR. In both cases, we could develop, on the back of what happens in the US, guidelines that may require some adaptation from market to market and country to country, but would establish some good rules. I've always been in favor of some form of accreditation in lobbying, both for firms and for individuals. The same could be true in financial PR. Such a system should be totally transparent. The clients must list their PR firm, and the PR firm must list their clients. Question three, our people. Our profession is an eclectic one. My generation fell into public relations because we were not very good at anything else. 
At the other end of the PR age spectrum, we have today bright, intelligent graduates, many of whom, after a general degree, have obtained a diploma or even a master's in public relations. What they lack in experience, they gain with the aggression and the way and the confidence they have in advising CEOs. I believe we can pat ourselves firmly on the back in this regard. We say it often enough, as I have tried to indicate, we say it often enough, this business is all about the people we employ, but we do not pay attention to their quality or their management. We have the HR offices, the rules of engagement, the HR handbooks, but it's not about the quality of those staff handbooks. It's about the quality of the hands who accept them. And however good the people are we employ, our people management is suspect. Our pool of people is limited. We fish in the same pool for our people assets. I worked recently for a major global company. They put the appointment of people, our asset, at the center of their business. The building of a responsible, moral, uplifting culture is something which has made that top management quite exceptional. Let me tell you this. They give 15 or 16 hours of interviews for relatively low-level second-job executive candidates in their mid to late 20s. They have a monthly performance note to file, which is shared with your boss and your boss's boss. They have a quarterly three-hour appraisal. They have a six-monthly 360-degree review. They have salaries, spot bonuses, annual awards geared to those performance reviews. They have training programs to fill the gaps in knowledge and experience as revealed by the performance reviews. And if you don't get a bonus equivalent to 15% of your salary at the end of the year, then you're toast. That's what we should be doing, up and down our businesses. I know it's time consuming, I know it's expensive, I know it's intensive management, but how else do you really know what is going on inside your company and the quality of the people that you employ? For my part, I also worry that my personal view determines too many policies in my company. Why should my belief that it's morally wrong to promote cigarette smoking determine the future of our relationship with the tobacco industry? Why should my beliefs about human rights or the testing of drugs on animals or abortion determine on which clients Grayling can work? The culture of the entire organization should resolve this. And that doesn't mean consensus management. What a disastrous concept that is. Uh, that doesn't mean um, consensus management. It requires meticulous care in the selection, the training, and the management of the people we employ. Final question. Truth. When should we tell the truth? Always? The full truth? Should we hold back information which questions, undermines, or even invalidates our client claim or our client position? More difficult, do we so interrogate our client affairs that before we make a significant announcement, we have honestly questioned every aspect of that release to make absolutely 100% certain that it is correct in every regard? Paul Holmes wrote a brilliant piece on this. I'm going to read you the paragraph. The public relations industry's credibility problem is the result of intellectual dishonesty, a consequence of the belief that any statement, any contention, any debating point that is not a lie is therefore an acceptable part of the public discourse. To a certain extent, he continues, the attitude is the inevitable result of a code of conduct that forbids lying. If lying is prohibited, then anything that is not a lie is almost by definition permitted. Professional codes of conduct, like government regulations, encourage precisely that kind of compliance mindset 
diverting attention from less obvious but equally egregious breaches of the social contract between institutions and the public. And he is absolutely right. We're not charities. We're in this business for commercial reasons. We need to be hard-headed and commercial in economically tough times. That does not mean we are without values, but it does mean we shouldn't overstate them either. Lying is not just about not telling the truth. When it is it right, positively right, and not just not wrong, to hold back information or to choose a time in which bad news will be buried? When can we spin the news just to avoid facing up to its worst implications? But who would deny that honest spin, and I shudder a bit as I say that, where, who would deny that honest spin, the forthright promotion and explanation of a coherent point of view, is a crucial part of public relations, persuasion, and the democratic process? Fighting your corner is too often rejected as spin. But in my mind, there is nothing unethical or immoral in working hard to get yourself heard and, as a result, attention being paid to your case. Indeed, as I say, in a democratic society, it's our duty so to do. I want to conclude this lecture with a statement and then a challenge. First, the statement. After nearly 50 years in this industry, which I love, there are genuinely difficult moral decisions which have to be taken by all businesses of all sides, sizes, and ours is no exception. That moral leadership must come from the top. Why from the top? Because that is where the big trade-offs happen, between what is morally right and what is commercially expedient. And it is from there that the culture of the whole organization emanates. It's all about leadership, and it's all about courage. The courage to do the right thing, defined not by what is legal, what you can get away with, but what is right when measured against a value system in which you corporately believe. That is the well of goodwill upon which you can draw when the going gets tough or the crisis strikes as it sure as hell will. Now, secondly, my challenge. I've tried to argue that there are many, many issues of morality and ethical behavior in this vitally important professional service we provide. That to address this, we need to look deep into ourselves as managers, but also as people, at how we recruit, how we manage, at how we balance commercial issues and the truth. And finally, how we sleep soundly at night with our conscious, consciences calm that we are completing our lives in a way that makes us and those we love proud. So every year, I want this Grayling lecture series to take one of these moral and ethical issues, forensically examine it in depth, and propose practical steps we can all take to live better, fuller, and yet commercially successful lives. Every year, another issue. Every year, another answer every year another step forward. Because, to paraphrase General Oman Bradley, if we don't want to be communications giants but ethical infants, it is in our hands to start a revolution which will take the profession to new levels of excellence and new levels of respect. And let me make this clear. If we do not address these issues, then others are going to do it for us. And if you don't think that's likely, look how the Leveson inquiry is challenging the authority of the British press. The Jimmy Savile scandal that is challenging the BBC at its very core. Consider the damage suffered by the Roman Catholic Church or the UK politicians and the expenses scandal. Institutions and professions are being turned upside down in every corner of the world in a new age, a new age of accountability, bringing in its train a faster and more brutal process of public scrutiny. We have no right to expect that this tsunami of public accountability will not engulf our industry 
as it has so many others. Perhaps in this room, there are one or two of you here who would like to pick up this challenge in the years ahead and take one of the subjects I've raised and deliver a grayling lecture in the future. I'd welcome that situation. And let me leave you then with this thought. On my desk at home, I have a quote from Aristotle, which I commend to you all and read every day. The quote is this, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. So I urge us all to apply excellence to our ethical and moral stance. By making the examination of these our central habit, we will further secure the foundations of a profession of which we can truly all be proud. Thank you very much. Paul, Paul Holmes has kindly said that I could answer a couple of questions. If anybody has a question they'd like to ask me, I would be very, very happy to, uh, to answer them or be challenged over anything I've said. Yes, there's somebody down here. Okay, can you speak up loud? Has somebody got a microphone? It's coming. Uh, Peter, first of all, thank you for a most uh, stimulating lecture. Thank you. Um, you made a case, it seemed to me, earlier on in your talk, uh, for some degree of cultural relativism when it came to trying to establish what a standard of ethics might be. And when I was young, I took great comfort in cultural relativism because it seemed to me that there were places like Amsterdam or even parts of California where could one, one could both smoke and inhale, even though it was illegal where I was. Um, but work, doing a lot of work in Asia and China, I have some sympathy towards a pragmatic view. But nonetheless, to take two examples, aren't human rights and truth, human rights and truth, wherever they are in the world? Well, I take, uh, I, I mean, I think this is exactly the problem. That's why I say you can't have global ethics. I mean, it just doesn't work. I, I think it depends on the group, I've decided. You see, if your culture is something that is prepared to... Let's just take cigarettes as an example. If you're prepared to believe that is something that you as a group feel perfectly comfortable about doing, I don't think we should stop you doing it. Um, I wouldn't want to do that. I wouldn't want a company I was responsible for to do that, and I wouldn't want the culture to accept it. Your human rights problem is, of course, a massive issue particularly when you've got countries that are espousing to change their human rights policy over a period of time. And that's what I really meant about asking the questions hard enough. Are you really convinced they're going to do it? And then I say to myself, well, we operate in China. I say to myself, there are parts of the world where there are political prisoners. Um, I mean, take something extreme. Take Belarus as an example, where the... People would say that the human rights were at a very low ebb. But there's a country which is pretty determined to do its best to put it right. So it's a very hard series of questions. And I think it all boils down to the culture that you have in your firm. If you want to do it and you feel comfortable about doing it, then I think you should be allowed to do it because it fits in with your views of life. Please, there's a gentleman here. Uh, Peter, my name's Stephen Forshaw. Can I firstly congratulate you on an inspiring and brilliant speech? I think Thanks. something that, uh, for me, made the journey from Singapore well worth every mile to come I'm here. Kind of you, so thank, thank you. you. Can I ask you to take the points you were talking about today, how do we inculcate all of those views in younger PR practitioners? How do we make sure that the next generation of leadership in this practice uh, both understands and, uh, if you like, uh, um, walks the talk? Well, that's really, thank you very much for that. I, I'm going to say something which the sort of thing gets me into trouble. I think the people in this industry who are under 30 
are significantly better than any generation we have ever had. I'm also of the view, I'm, 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 I'm also of the view that the women in our industry under 30 are both better respected as professionals than has ever been the case before. The best people I've ever worked with in this industry have been women because they are, generally speaking, much more sensitive to what is happening in the client relationship than the man is. They seem more able to accept bad news than a man is. Um, and so to see this generation coming through is, to me, extremely encouraging. I'd also say I've got four children in their 20s, three of whom are, I was going to say girls, but I'll have to say women, I suppose, Th um, and two of them are in this business, uh, one with Google and one with uh, Big Brother. And I think they have, a, they have a better moral center than we had. They, they're not prepared to cut corners. So I have enormous hope that the kind of issue I've been talking about, and, and, it, and it does mean something else. It means that my generation and probably the one below us have got to move on pretty quickly because we can't hold this generation back, not only for that reason, but for another reason, which is that they are digitally native. And that is terribly important. The future of this industry is digital. So if we can combine digital knowledge, we can look at this moral sense that I'm talking about, and we can get particularly women of the quality I'm talking about, this industry is in good hands. Can I make this, Harris, can I just make this the last one because I have to go and catch the night flight back to London. And then that's perfectly appropriate because I won't turn it into a question, but I will turn it into a statement, okay. which is not only do we appreciate what you said tonight, but for many of the members of the audience, I'm not quite sure that they quite understand that our firm was founded at your home where those children currently live. And on behalf of all the folks at Weber Shanwick, we want to thank you for what you did tonight and what you did in the past. Thank you, Harris, very much indeed. I appreciate it. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you.